um, Senator Solomon's going to Senator Solomon's going to join us briefly. Um, then we'll get some feedback that Duncan will lead around um, the equity survey, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, this is our second to last meeting. We we plan to have one more, um, just to sort of circle around, put it all together. And I am going to stop and turn it over to Mike, who I believe is on, and he can uh, uh, introduce um, Angie if she is with us. I don't know if she's been able to join yet or not. Super. Thanks, Teresa. Um, yeah. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks. We've got a great crowd here today. So um, I think many of you were on when we had, a, I think, our first meeting when we had Angie Albi from the Oregon Health Authority kind of give, uh, I think, a very you know, kind of helpful overview of what what is going on in Oregon. This was back, gosh, Angie, I think back in August when we first had you on. Um, obviously, a lot has transpired uh since then. And kind of the goal for today was just to kind of get an update of kind of what is happening on the ground since kind of everything kind of got launched in in, in January um, and it's any lessons learned. But then also just a specific, Ben, anything on the equity front as we really are trying to lean in on kind of get better understanding of what was written in the in the Washington law and the social opportunity program. Because, I, you know, Washington, the Oregon, uh, the Oregon uh, Health Authority had a uh, Equity subcommittee, as Teresa mentioned, and just some some insights from from Angie um, for this group. So we've asked her to kind of give a 15, 20 minute with some time for Q and A. So Angie, always so appreciative of you taking time to kind of give us an update. But uh, I'll turn things over to you. Thanks, Mike, and hello everyone. Um, it's really great to be here and to provide an update to you all. I'll try to make it brief so we can spend time with Q and A. Um, again, my name is Angie Albi. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the manager of the Oregon Psilocybin Services Section. Um, we're housed within the Oregon Health Authority Public Health Division Center for Health Protection. Um, I also serve as the ex officio executive director of the Oregon Psilocybin Advisory Board. Um, I went ahead and prepared just a couple of um, pieces of information to start off with. Um, we began accepting applications for licenses on January 2nd of this year um, after we had adopted all of our final rules on December 27th and then completed our development period December 31st. Um, so we have begun accepting applications. Um, we're reviewing those in the order that we receive them. Um, some applications have been experiencing a few delays. If they are incomplete, we need additional paperwork, there's something missing. Um, they're also going through a background check process, which I'll um, talk about briefly at the end as we talk more about equity. Um, manufacturer service center and testing lab licenses, um, all of those applications require site inspections. And so although we're getting ramped up to do a couple of site inspections, um, we have not completed those yet. Um, still waiting for that review and background check process um, to complete for those first initial applicants. We know that um, we have that first cohort of students finishing up their psilocybin facilitator training programs. So we expect to see an influx of applications once um, you know, they wrap up and graduate from those programs. Um, we know that testing labs may be going through the accreditation pro process with the Oregon Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program. And we know that manufacturer and service center applicants are really going through a challenging uh, land use compatibility statement process. Um, local cities and counties in Oregon have either adopted ordinances to prohibit manufacturers or service centers from operating in their local jurisdictions, or if voters did not approve those, or um, if the voters decided not to pass them or they didn't adopt ordinances, they still can adopt time, place, and manner regulations. And so we're seeing some changes to land use and zoning laws that have impacted those applicants. So a lot of folks are still kind of figuring out um, what to do. They're waiting for their land use compatibility statement process to be completed with their local cities and counties. Um, I'm gonna run through some quick numbers so I can pivot to talking about equity, which I think deserves a lot of time. And I'm, I'm really happy to see that you're having this conversation today. Um, we have not received any facilitator applications, but we do have almost 80 that are pending in our system that have names attached. So again, 
we think that those folks are just finishing up with their training programs. Um, we've had 10 manufacturer applications submitted for our review, and we do have about 40 that are in the system pending with names attached. We've received four service center applications that have been submitted for our review, and we've got 10 more in the system with names attached. We've got two lab applications submitted for our review and three more in the system with names attached. We have 121 worker permit applications that have been submitted. Um, we have 17 that have been approved. And then we have another 41 that are in the system with names attached. And to date, we have approved 21 facilitator training programs and we still have another one um, under review in the system. So that's a, a very brief look at our numbers. I hope that's helpful as we start to look, take an early look at what's happening in Oregon and um, really getting excited for opening service center doors um, this year. Uh, I'll go ahead and just mention a couple of other factors that are important. Um, we have worked really hard on developing our training program licensing and compliance system. We call it TLC. Um, it's created efficiency for processing applications. And I think it's been really, uh, we've heard been very user friendly and helping folks understand what's expected of them as far as application documents and also um, the attestations that they have to go through. Um, so I think it's uh, been really helpful that we've developed step-by-step -step guides on how to apply in that online application portal, or if people choose to, um, they could do a paper application as well. And we've got guides for both. We also have significant amounts of information under each license type on our website that has fact sheets that are translated in Spanish and English uh, or available in Spanish and English. Uh, we also have a lot of documents. Um, the operational documents required in our rules are translated into Spanish. So you'll find those on the facilitator and the service center page. Um, we wanted to be helpful and, and make sure that people had um, information available to them and that we weren't overburdening um, our licensees. Um, Last thing I wanna say about the process of reviewing applications, we've been operating at 50% staff capacity until last week. Uh, we just hired three new compliance specialists for our compliance team, and we'll be hiring three licensing specialists over the next coming you know, few weeks. Um, it's been challenging because we have some state agency infrastructure requirements and challenges that we've had over the past year and a half, two years. And so we're really looking forward to having a complete team. Um, and so more to come with that. I'm gonna stop and, and pivot now um, to talk a little bit more about equity and then I'll um, make sure that you all uh, have an opportunity to uh, have your questions answered. Um, I wanna say first that equity is centered, is foundational, is so important to all of this work. And I hope all of us at this point recognize that it takes representation from many different communities, from communities of color, from LGBTQIA2S plus community, from tribal and indigenous community members, from you know all parts of this work, um, end of life, older adults, um, people with disabilities, and the list goes on and on about the number of communities that we really need to speak with, veterans. Um, and so I think it's really important to think about equity as work that's never done and always central to what you're doing and thinking. Part of this is representation, um, obviously in our advisory boards, um, on our teams where we're implementing work, when we're doing partner outreach, there's a lot of information coming in. Um, we've also offered community circles to many communities, uh, specifically to indigenous communities, but many others who really wanna have a, a space that they feel safe in, in providing information to us. Um, we need representation in our regulated community so that people understand the importance of providing access um, and the way that culturally responsive access, what that looks like. Um, and we all know that we're all unraveling the impact of the war on drugs that have disproportionately impacted communities of color, you know, for such a long time, as well as the way that colonized, you know, mindset has affected our policy implementation and many communities. I think it's really important to acknowledge the ecosystem that we're working within, um, recognizing that indigenous and tribal communities have used psilocybin for centuries, for thousands of years. So this conversation didn't just begin. Um, now, when we have a legalized framework, it's something that's very connected to culture, to land, to environment, and so much more. We also have to recognize the decades of research 
research that's been done by medical, psychological, and academic institutions that have really provided momentum for the work today. Um, and really thinking about how we unravel the bias and stigma and the trauma caused by the war on drugs. We really talk about how we're you know, implementing and shifting away from a drug policy framework rooted in the war on drugs to, to a health policy framework that really um, provides promise for healing and wellness. And we want to recognize Black, Indigenous, people of color, and tribal communities who have been most negatively impacted by the war on drugs and who have been left out of conversations for such a long time. Um, we want to promote justice, diverse, diversity, equity, and inclusion in our work. Um, quickly, I'll just say that um, you know, as the ex officio executive director of the board, I can speak to recommendations that came from the equity subcommittee and came um, to the board, but I'd also like to, to highlight that we've received a lot of really important information from many partners. Um, the public health division in Oregon uh, contracted with over 177 community-based organizations to help administer work during COVID. And we've continued to bring those partners in along with Oregon's nine federally recognized tribes and our public health authorities into our system. And so we've been working closely to present to those folks to receive information and hear you know, what's important. We've also done community circles and lots of partner outreach. So um, you know, we're always looking to continue that work as much as possible. Um, one of the key issues, um, aside from representation, is resources. Um, there have been no state funds attached to help uh, subsidize cost for licensees um, to create access. And there also has been no funds available to subsidize cost of services for clients. So those are issues that Oregon is going to have to deal with and address together. Um, quickly, I'll just say that um, I'm seeing some questions come in, so I want to get to those. Um, the equity subcommittee gave some really important recommendations. Um, some of those are doing an annual review of the recommendations and seeing where we need to evolve and adjust. And we absolutely agree with that and, and are going to be doing that. Hearing from public, um, we're creating public listening sessions. We offer Spanish interpretation, American Sign Language interpretation. Um, that's important. It's important to normalize that there's not just one language spoken in this country and we need to provide access to everyone. That should be in our budget. It's not something that is other. So that's something that we've really centered and prioritized in our team. Um, and you know the lower dose administration sessions, many people call microdosing. Even though microdose is not used in our statute, um, we wanted to create an opportunity so folks can use a small dose and, and stay at the licensed service center for a very minimal period of time. Um, so that's something that we really appreciated that came from many conversations in the equity subcommittee, thinking about access and affordability, um, as well as client the range of client experiences. Social equity plans, um, we've adopted this in our rules. Every licensed applicant is required to provide a social equity plan to us so that we can ensure that as we move forward, um, you know, social equity planning and equity is being centered. Um, we didn't have enough team members. There was a delicate balance of how much additional work would require additional staffing that would raise licensing fees and what could we do to prioritize within the current structure that we have with our team. And so that was something that we really wanted to uphold as well as um, we gave a 50% reduction for licensing fees. And the facilitator fees are much lower than the ones for entities, um, the manufacturer service center and testing labs. Unfortunately, we are fee-based. So the cost of licensing fees have to cover the cost of our work. And there's an expectation that we'll be completely, you know, uh, sustainable based on those licensing fees. So we did offer a reduction. We couldn't do a sliding scale because that's another staff person and, and higher licensing fees at this point in time. Um, there were other recommendations that we couldn't uphold, um, you know, delivery methods of psilocybin, obviously um, consume is something that means uh, to consume orally. Uh, we worked on that and we couldn't do the pulmonary transmucosal and transdermal, but we did allow for feeding tubes. Um, I think I've talked about that before. And I think that the other thing to just draw your attention to is there was a lot of support for the entheogenic practitioner framework. Um, and so that is for any 
person who uses uh, psilocybin for religious, spiritual, or ceremonial purposes. And that framework wanted to create less restrictive standards for entheogenic practitioners. We really wanted to look into that. And typically we don't share our legal opinions or guidance from our Department of Justice, but this was really important to us that people had information. And so that is posted on our website. Um, and we found that apply, applying fewer restrictions for entheogenic practitioners would likely be viewed as granting a privilege to a religion that's not available on a secular basis. And so you can read more about that framework there. I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, we had so much great feedback and we're looking forward to the future. Um, our advisory board voted to continue four of the five subcommittees as we move into um, the future work that are that is happening. And so we'll still have an equity subcommittee. Um, we'll have a licensing subcommittee. We'll have a products and research subcommittee and then a uh, sustainability, long-term planning and sustainability subcommittee. I'm gonna stop there because I'm seeing a lot of questions come in and I don't know how um, you want to monitor these questions if you want me to just go ahead and try to address them or if anyone wants to specifically read uh, read them out loud for me. Sure, happy to happy to do that, Angie. Let me get this little pop-up out of my way. Um, I think one of the, the questions rising around is sort of the, the, the challenge, and you talked about this a little bit between equity and the high licensing fees and, and both how, you know, if you had the opportunity, how would how would you set it up? And then is there any anticipation that as the program grows, you'll be able to lower some of those licensing fees um, in the future? Uh, so I do think that's one focus question. Absolutely. Great question. Yes, we would love to lower licensing fees. Um, that is a goal. That's why we're being very mindful about the cost of our work, um, uh, how we're doing our work and making sure that we can handle our specific workload as we move forward. Um, until there's additional state funds related to covering the cost of our work um, or helping to subsidize licensing fees for applicants, um, it, it, it will be um, the number. It's a, it's a math equation. Unfortunately, I hate to reduce it to that, but it's our budget and the number of license, the, the number of applicants or not even applicants, it's the number of licenses we issue. Um, we're working now on budget sustainability. Um, you know, I, I think resources are really important. When we talk about equity, a lot of people are saying the word equity, but it's really what matters is how are you taking those, those resources and allocating them to truly support um, equity in this work. And that could be um, additional support. So there's representation in the regulated community that could be additional support to subsidize cost of services for clients. Um, we think a strong point of uh, like, we have this opportunity to provide culturally responsive services to communities around the state. But if we don't have representation, then that's going to be problematic, um, you know, and so we think that that's really incredibly important. Um, I would say that again, resources are incredibly important. So whatever you can do to ensure that um, at the end of the day, we work within a state budgeting process and we work under the guidance of the governor. So it's something that, um, you know, we support the governor's budget. Uh, we were prioritized in the governor's budget this time around, but not for general fund support. So we are expected to be solely functioning, um, you know, through licensure fees at this time. Um, I think that the other piece is you want to have adequate staff to process. Um, I've, I've seen something about um, reducing the number of staff. I mean, I think we're gonna see an influx of applications coming in. So as we're talking about budget and licensing fees, you do wanna make sure you have adequate staff be, because I don't know about specifically for Washington, but with measure 109 and the statutory language, these are annual licensing fees. So we wanna get out there. We wanna make sure that we're doing site inspections in a timely manner. We wanna make sure that we're of service to our regulated community. This is not like us versus them. We're trying to approach this through a technical uh, assistance and education approach. We want people to be successful. Um, this is not a gotcha environment where we're utilizing the same structure from the war on drugs. This is something where if there's an egregious violation, yes, we will address that. Um, however, it's also about ensuring that our licensees understand how to be in compliance with all the regulations. There's a lot and also our centering client safety. And so I do think having an adequate, um, adequately resourced team is important to do that work. 
Um, I know that I probably said a lot in that, and I don't know if I answered all of those questions, there but is, I hope so. Angie, there is another one, actually. Yeah. And, and can the health authority seek donations from public uh, or partners or partner with nonprofits so that there can be some reduction in the licensing fees. So you just don't have to rely on the state budget alone, which has vagaries as we all know. Yeah, I, I don't think that's possible. Um, we've talked about all of the possibilities. I think that the community can do this work without the state as far as, um, you know, if there are donations, the community knows best. Um, I think getting the, that those finances, that, that funding support, getting those resources to community organizations that can help understand how to prioritize them uh, would be much more effective than creating a new position within a state agency structure that costs more money um, to allocate those resources. If the state allocated resources um, to us, we would of course do that work. But I think that if there are donations that um, people are interested in donations, I think getting those directly to people where it matters is really helpful and important. We've been talking to folks um, that have done years and years of cannabis equity work, uh, you know, and, and one thing we're learning is cr we create an infrastructure to specifically do this work um, and to be effective and it takes time. And currently within the, the infrastructure we've created to do this regulatory framework implementation for Measure 109, we don't have that kind of infrastructure yet. So I would strongly recommend either building it or um, really uh, hoping that the community that has resources to, to dedicate to this work can do that. And Angie, one final question looks like, and that is, uh, well, okay, two final questions, then we do need to move on. One, thank you so much for coming. Um, the question was, will facilitators be required to continue do continue in education to maintain their licensure? And if so, what does that look like, if you know? And I'll, while you're answering that, I'll look for the final question here I saw. Yeah, um, so the initial recommendations and what we adopted in rules, because remember, we expedited those early on in 2022 um, did not have continuing education, but I know that there will be, you know, lots of uh, conversation about this. And again, we are entirely open. Um, we know that we're gonna have to make adjustments. We're gonna have to evolve this work. Um, and so it's really important that we stay open to um, what's happening and, and how we can improve uh, our work and our rules. So it is something that I think is coming. It just wasn't part of the initial recommendations. and and really anything that came forward um, when we did our rulemaking. Um, Dorothy, and could you unmute uh, Senator Solomon, please? I see he has his hand up. Are you there, Senator? Yeah, can you hear me? We can. Oh, great. Uh, we got some feedback regarding screening. Uh, the screening process to make sure you know people don't have experience with psychosis, etc. Um, can anybody? Can you explain how that's going in terms of the rigor of the screening? Absolutely. Sorry, did you want to finish your your question? I was just asking if that question makes sense. It sounds like you understand. Thank you, Senator. Yes. So um, we had to walk a really delicate line with scope of practice because licensed facilitators are cannot practice on other license types, including assessment, diagnosis, um, and other professional licensing uh, activities. And so we worked with Oregon's professional licensing boards to understand their concerns. And that was one of them. So we had to separate the scope of practice and ensure that our client intake process, our preparation session, didn't, uh, didn't have uh, what we call scope creep. Um, and so what we did was we had um, the, we have the three exclusions in our client information process. One is if someone has taken lithium um, in the last 30 days, they will not uh, qualify for services. The second one, if someone has a uh, 
uh, diagnosis for active psychosis at any time in their lives, they would not qualify for services. And the third is if there is ideation about harming self or others, they would not qualify for services. I know there's been a concern about, well, what if someone lies in their preparation session? But I think that the licensed facilitators, um, part of our rules is that they can they can say no, they can, they can decline access to an administration session um, at any time. And so if they have a concern and something's not um, seemingly connecting, they have that ability to do that. Um, there's so much to say here, and there's a lot to balance when we think of equity and access and trying to balance those appropriately and to ensure that people are able to access services and do so safely. We adopted over 70 pages of rules. So if you're ever really curious that you want some reading material, we're very proud of the work and we know they're not, it, we know our rules are, are a place to start from, but I think we've been really thoughtful and tried to center the client experience as much as possible. We want this to be trauma informed and culturally responsive. Angie, th thank you so much. Uh, you are clearly a wealth of information and I know the group has a, a ton more questions. Uh, we do wanna move on to our other guests this morning. Um, thank you uh, for taking the time to, to join us and, and uh, help us learn along with Oregon um, how your path is going. Uh, really appreciate it. You're welcome to, to stay and listen. I suspect if you're short staff still, you don't have time. Uh, but uh, feel free to, to, to continue to, to listen in um, if you if you have the time and would like to. Um, we're going to switch up the agenda a little bit. Um, we have two guests who we asked to join us today, um, and, and uh, Ben has to leave at 10, so we're going to um, actually uh, move Duncan's equity framing um, after this next discussion, but I would like to um, introduce, uh, or Mike, are you going to introduce Brian and, and Ben? Uh, either way, Teresa, I'd be happy to. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Sure. Um, well, thanks to uh, Brian Jansen and Ben Tobias, and we also had uh, Todd Youngs on the um scheduled for today, but he unfortunately came down with, with COVID, so he is he is uh, recovering right now. Um, but this was part of our discussions as a work group uh, early on about just, you know, having some um, input and dialogue with the religious community. And uh, again, I'm looking at, at Nathan uh, Sackett, so many thanks to Nathan and Brian Anderson, who we reached out to for some, some contacts, and we were able to put together a uh, a call several weeks ago with um, with Ben and Brian. I think it was really illuminating on our end just to hear about you know how they have you know evolved their um, education and training um, with psychedelics. And I think there was just I think it was an opportunity just to have you know Ben and Brian be able to talk to the work group about their learnings and understanding. As again, we as we think about a statewide program, how can we kind of tap into folks who really are very experienced in this? And I think as we think about setting up a, a state program related to safety, related to the credentialing, all of that, you know, are some things that we can kind of tap into them and, and understand. So I think, you know, again, it was, I think it was a very helpful conversation on our end. We wanted to kind of continue that discussion with you guys today. Uh, so I think Sharissa was going to maybe kind of lead just a, some, some key questions and discussions, and then kind of have a little bit of a Q and A with you guys as well. Cause I think we really want to make sure that we are kind of tapping into experts, uh, before we kind of have our final list of recommendations. So Ben and, uh, and Brian, I'll let them kind of do their own introductions because I think they, which is really impressive. But then from there, I think we'll we'll get into some some uh, some key questions discussion from there. Right. So Ben, do you want to go first? Sure, thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, first I'll say thanks for having me here. It's really um, an honor and a pleasure and uh, I'm really new entering into this part of the discussion. So I'm mostly here to learn. Um, my history is that I've been uh, involved in the Santo Daime Church, which is a, an ayahuasca church that comes from Brazil. Um, for about 13 years, uh, I've had my own church out of my home for the last uh, five or so. Um, and uh, so that's the main context that I really have worked uh, intensively with people with, with um, entheogens. And uh, that's kind of the, the, the lineage and the, and the, um, training that I've received is mostly come through my involvement with that church. Um, I also hold, uh, 
one-on-one -on -one sessions with people. Uh, I'm starting to expand that as part of my, my life and practice. Uh, so working with other medicines as well. Um, but really the foundation of all my training comes from, from my involvement in that church. Uh, I guess that's all I'll say for now. Thanks. Great. And Brian. Um, well, like Ben, I started with the Santo Dime. Um, it'll be 30 years in two days. So uh, then, but I also had a lot of involvement with the UDV, which is a, another hybrid Judeo-Christian shamanic religion that originated in Brazil. And, um, and you know, I grew up in the Northwest, so there were mushrooms as a teenager in the 70s. We were out in the cow fields and uh, picking liberty caps and the like, and that's, it's just been part of the, the mix here. Great, thank you. Um, wanted to just kind of probably focus on two questions and then and have the group then ask any any questions or share their thoughts. Uh, and the first is, given that you both have a long history in working with entheogens, are there sort of things that you would caution us or things you would ask you would hope that we would consider specifically around the safety? of allowing um, more broad access to psilocybin. Um, curious as to your thoughts about that. Ben, please. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's of course a big issue. I think that what I've heard about, so from Angie about kind of the, the limiting factors that would prevent someone from having access to treatment uh, in the Oregon plan are pretty similar to what we use in our church. Um, we ask questions about uh, psychological history. Uh, we ask questions about active addiction. Um, and ultimately, you know, it's, it's sort of a combination of, of data and intuition. Uh, which it sounds like is is kind of what Oregon is promoting uh, in the idea that the provider can basically decide they're not going to offer treatment regardless of how the person asked the question, answered the questions uh, on the questionnaire. Um, so I think that's really similar to how we do it. Um, are, are, are you asking about safety, kind of uh, just the ability to come in and sort of that that kind of firewall there? Or are you thinking more in terms of like, uh, how do we manage situations that feel like safety is an issue? Like once someone is is already there, I, I think that, and then and and then perhaps also, you know, intuition works if you have a familiarity. Like how how like how important is training? How important is the right. facilitator work to get to that point of being able to sort of hear someone but know or understand that? So kind of that that piece, if you'd be willing. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the place that, of course, like, I personally have the biggest concern is like, how, how do, how is the, how are the, the people going to be trained? And uh, what's the accountability and what is also just the, the mentorship and, and support look like for them? Um, the, the, the bottom line is like, for me, in my experience, uh, you know, people don't, don't start to serve medicine in the context that I use it until they've um, received quite a lot. Uh, and along the way, not only um, taken part in a lot of medicine work themselves, but sort of been mentored and, um, and have a, a lineage that they can lean into uh, both a spiritual or, or, you know, um, energetic lineage, but also literal people that they can talk to that, that can help, um, uh, you know, give advice and, and parameters and guidelines for what to watch for and how to handle situations. And that's the kind of thing. It's like, how do you train that for someone, you know, if they're going to take a six month training or a year long training and they've never facilitated before, I don't really know how you cram, uh, the, the years and years of experience that I think are, are kind of necessary, uh, into a an, into a facilitator training uh, that's sponsored by the state. I, I don't really know how. I'm not saying that you can't. Uh, it's hard for me to envision it. But um, but anyway, that's Great. my perspective. Thanks, Brian. You want to share your thoughts? Uh, it is hard to envision, other than a, a year in the Amazon jungle, maybe, because experience is really the number one thing that supports the accurate. You called it intuition, but it's it, a lot of it's that experience. And um, without the First Nations and Indigenous traditions really involved in that, not just training, but creating this backlog of experience that's needed years worth, really, um, 
I don't see the I don't see the path right now, but I'm here to learn, and I'm new to pretty new to all this, so I'm I'm real interested. There, there's a question I think that that it would be helpful in the chat that, um, you know, what are your connections to indigenous populations, if you have any, and, and are the elements of your religious practice similar to or modeled after or aligned with um, uh, indigenous folks? I mean, you mentioned a specific church, and I imagine that has some, um, you know, elements that have been carried through time, but just curious if you could respond to that piece in the chat. That'd be great. Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think um, it's such an interesting question to ask in the context of this discussion where, you know, a state-sponsored program that's going to, uh, um, you know, try to sort of take this into the medical model and into the sort of North American uh, way of doing things, um, you know, is there going to be any, any consciousness around that? I personally uh, am mentored and supported by elders from Brazil, um, some of whom are like fully indigenous, some of which are mixed. There's, you know, in Brazil, there's a, there's a very broad spectrum of diversity uh, and people who have lived there for a long time, but were originally um, have have ancestry that was colonizer and ancestry that was indigenous and ancestry that was uh, African uh, enslaved peoples that were brought. Um, and so I have connections with people that are, uh, fall under all those categories um, from Brazil that directly support me and and also the church, the other churches in North America that support me. There's a, there's a whole network. Um, so I don't really make any big decisions without the, the thumbs up from from folks that um, that I'm connected to in Brazil. Um, Brian. Yeah, it's um, such a great question. Um, and I don't know if this is commonly used, but the way I think about it is there's a distinction between First Nations, say the Peyote Church, right, which goes way back, and Indigenous. So the two traditions out of Brazil we mentioned, the Santo Dime and the Uniao de Vegetal, they're Indigenous. They emerged in Brazil, but they're at the same time hybrids. So these are Judeo-Christian shamanic churches. There's a distinction. And then I was a little alarmed when I heard about the entheogenic practitioner distinction. Boy, I'm not sure where those boundaries lie exactly, because that seems to me to be one functional group. Entheogenic practitioners, indigenous and First Nations. And I really think that that's where the experience is going to come from. This is this. This is not, these are not synthetics that were developed 70 years ago or something. These are substances that we co-emerged with and co-evolved with and go, the use goes back tens of thousands of years. So training is one thing, experience is another. Hands-on training is being experienced. Um, I see, Senator Solomon, do you have a, a question? Is your hand up from? from before uh thank you uh I, I i do try to practice good hand raising hygiene so yeah this is a new question i lowered <laughs> great <laughs> so so the question is you know these uh, i'm sorry i forgot the names but the two speakers here practice i think a form of shamanism where our facilitator our facilitator training isn't really focused on that uh, so i think there's a a more complex aspect uh, of sh when you're applying shamanism. So I think that could be a distinction. I, what we're trying to do here is sort of make it more of a user guided experience uh, with a fairly hands off facilitator training. So just wondering if you want to speak to that distinction. Yeah, it's a distinction I don't buy really. Um, you know, this is, we're talking about a holistic model. These are natural substances, right? So carbon it up into psychoanalytic or all these different levels. I think we're looking for the common ground between these traditions. And it's not just shamanism. Again, it's Judeo-Christian. There's strong Western elements, and that's an indigenous tradition out of Brazil. So I just be really careful about that kind of distinction. 
Yeah, the word shaman is a really loaded term. I don't consider myself a shaman, a shaman, uh, and I don't really consider uh, myself as a shamanic practitioner. Really, um, I think that the the norms and rituals of the of the Santo Daimi Church that is the main focus of my practice uh, are very clear. Uh, and the, we, we don't do anything particularly that, that you would look at and say, oh, that person's a shaman. Um, it's a, it's a, a, a Christian church that uses, uh, the Santo Daimi, which is what we call the ayahuasca, um, in combination with some indigenous, uh, elements, um, from Brazil, from the Amazon, uh, and also some Afro-Brazilian elements as well, um, and the word shaman is really like thrown around a lot. Uh, so it would be helpful to sort of clarify what you mean by shamanic or, or, or the, that we're shamans, because I don't I don't really consider that to be the case. I do consider that the, the, the plants have a consciousness and that when we are serving the plants and that and involving that consciousness, that consciousness is really kind of in charge. And so. Um, you know, how, how we respond to the directions and instructions that we receive from the plants and what we sort of invite into the, into the work um, in response to that, uh, you know, is up to an individual practitioner for sure. Um, and there are certainly practitioners that, that respond to that in, in ways that uh, don't look, you know, um, that, that, that someone could, who didn't know a whole lot would say, oh yeah, that's shamanism. Um, and, you know, maybe even some of those practitioners would say, yeah, I'm a shaman. Uh, me, I'm not one of those. And so um, it's it's just a really complicated question. Uh, I could talk for a really long time about it and probably shouldn't. So <laughs> I'll wrap it up there. Um, Senator Solomon, did that, um, did that answer your question for the moment? Yeah, I'm fine. I don't need to hijack the, okay. the meeting for uh, okay. getting um, you bet. Lisa, you've had, you've got some interesting questions that what you want to come off mute and, and just sort of um, ask your questions more directly instead of me reading them. Sure. Yeah. But, um, Brian and um, uh, I'm sorry, this, I ben. can't, and ben, ben, thank you for, for being here. And um, it's, um, thank you for your information. I just, I, I'm trying to get my head around um, what one of the questions I had again, trying to just get understand what's the difference between um, what how you're using the the plant or mushrooms um, and and regular underground use. Um, so I know that you were asked, and I was so excited uh, to understand um, what is a religious practice or a religious use. Uh, as compared to just a regular practice or a regular use. And I just wanted to get that dis that distinction. Um, Sunil, thank you for that link. And I'll be able to look at that later on. But that was that was my question as like a basis. So I, a pivot point. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. It's a good question. Really good question. Um, uh, we, are, our church here in Kenmore, which is just outside of Seattle, uh, is actually, we don't consider ourselves underground at all because the medicine that we receive, we receive from uh, a church down in Oregon and the Oregon churches have won, uh, legal case, uh, to legally serve import and serve, uh, the Santo Daime as part of our religious practice. And they've extended that decision now into Washington and California. And so we receive our, our medicine. It's all been inspected by the DEA accounted for, and, uh, we are no longer underground, which is a big celebration for us. It's not that long ago that that happened. Um, and uh, there's, of course, because of the nature of that, um, we have to serve that medicine within a very strict, like religious context, right? That, that it's part of the, the court case that we're going to be using that medicine within a, a very specific context. It doesn't get down to the like individual, like, you know, minute by minute, blow by blow of what we do in our ceremonies, but the, the general form of our ceremonies and the, the lineage that we're connected to and the, the way that we hold them is really connected to the legality of our medicine. So we are very careful to, um, to you know, uh, protect that. Um, 
within that, you know, so, so, uh, so part of that decision is that we use it within a church context, right? And like, you know, in a logistical sense, like there's a cross on the table in the middle of the work, and we um, say prayers, uh, Christian prayers, uh, at the beginning and the end of our ceremonies, and then we sing a lot of songs that um, involve Christian uh, content, as well as um, some uh, some connection to uh, indigenous Brazilian lineages and also Afro-Brazilian lineages. Um, but it's it's just all very specific and very prescribed. And and uh, so I, I'm not sure if that answers your question exactly, but that's, um, I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh, Brian, did you want to add? Um, I would just add that um, experience, back to experience. I mean, the amount of, let's say, a dose of ayahuasca that's determined by somebody who has a lot of experience. And um, uh, what what was called un underground or regular use, these are not really recreational substances. So moving into that kind of thing without experience, one of my, something really sad is people that just get excited about it and take a big dose of mushrooms, and that can go very badly. I do not recommend this. And so it's uninformed would be the primary difference, lack of experience, people just ignorant, getting excited and chomping down three grams of <laughs> mushrooms. It's just a bad idea. Great. Uh, there is a question in the chat that is, um, so what, what would you, Okay, let's see. So does the facilitator also participate in taking the plant medicines and it is a is it a group experience? It sounds like you mentioned, Ben, that there are both group as well as individual, at least from your perspective. That's the first question. Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm trying to keep track of the chat also. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's fine. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, mostly group. I do do some individual work, but mo uh, mostly group. Um, and I know that the word Christian and Christianity can be very, very triggering, triggering. It can be very, um, it can feel exclusionary. Uh, we're trying to redefine what Christianity means in our church, uh, to the people who come. And part of that is we don't require anybody to believe any particular thing. Nobody has to be a Christian. No, nobody has to call themselves a Christian, anything like that. Um, we do, you know, it's kind of necessary that we acknowledge that aspect of what we're doing, because if people show up and they don't know that that's what we're doing then they're going to be really triggered potentially and so we want to make sure that people know what they're getting into um but that said uh you know like i grew up atheist and it took me a long time to be able to actually call myself a christian and i still don't really think of myself as a, as a mainstream christian that's for sure um but uh but we do we do um you know, it, it, it comes from Brazil, which was originally, a, a well, was colonized by the Portuguese. Uh, and so Catholicism played a big part in that whole process and informs the Santo Daime formation and, and uh, continued um, practice. So, um, so uh, we are Christian, but we don't, you know, everybody's welcome. We've had people come who are Jewish, who are Muslim, who are uh, Buddhist, who are atheists, who are, you know, you, you name it pretty much across the board. Everyone's welcome. We don't ask anyone to believe anything. We don't ask anyone to say any prayers they don't feel comfortable saying. It's like, we just ask that people be respectful while that's happening. If they don't want to participate, um, that's as far as it goes. Thanks Brian? for asking. It's such a great question. Um, boy, there's a lot of pull down menus on that one. I, um, so Michael Pollan's book, Change Your Mind, he put forward this idea of an observer, right? Someone who's not taking partaking of the medicine and is observing the person who is. So that's really a very much a Western scientific material science reductionist view, right? And these traditions, of course, the people participate or leading the sessions are participating in the medicine. And that's an important part of navigating it, both for themselves, the person they're working with, or the entire group. And group feels or entire families drinking tea at the same time. These are high level experiences that it takes some take some time to learn to navigate, right? And I was watching a podcast recently. They're like, yeah, you're not gonna get family psychedelic work approved by the FDA. But these churches have been doing it for, well, certainly decades, but the traditions go way back. So 
Um, this is where we're starting to work um, with Western science, which is curiosity driven, and these ancient traditions, which I would suggest are wisdom driven. Well said. Um, Sunil, you have a question. It might be better if you ask it than me try to interpret it and mess it up your intent. Thank you, Teresa. It's so good to see um, Ben and Brian here. I'm so glad you, you could, could join this discussion. I, I think the way I want to answer, ask my question is like this. There is a uh, RCW uh, 66 20, 20, um, which uh, I was going to paste in the chat here, but I'll just read it to you. It's, it's called Sacramental uh, Liquor and Wine. And it's a, it's a law from the early 20th, 1933. It was adopted. And it says, nothing in this title shall be construed as limiting the right of any minister, priest, or rabbi or religious organization from obtaining wine for sacramental purposes directly from any source whatsoever, whether from within the limits of the state of Washington or from outside the state, nor shall any fee be charged directly or indirectly for the exercise of this right. And anyways, that, that's kind of a, I sent this to the committee in August, but it's, it's a very specific law that allows rabbis, ministers, any religious organization to access their psychoactive sacrament of wine. And I'm just curious, like as, as ministers of different religions in this state, and we have really good religious freedom in this, in this under our constitution, how does it feel that there is an exception for that type of religious sacrament and not one for yours? Or, or do, you, do you feel that there's kind of a, any, what would, what would equality under that law look like for, for your religious practice? And, I'm just wondering if you care to comment on that. <laughs> That's an interesting question. I mean, I think I personally am a fan of decriminalizing, de decriminalizing basically everything. Um, that's kind of my perspective in general. Uh, so, and, and honestly, I, I don't, I don't, it's, it's interesting that this conversation took it, you know, the, 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 I'm coming from this church perspective. And so that's kind of like getting some focus. I don't particularly think that like we need to, to have a, a church and a sacrament, you know, the, 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 I don't think we need to have entheogens be within a church context only. That's just the context that I grew up in, so to speak. Uh, and so that's what I know, but that's, I'm, I am in no way attached to that being the only way to do it, or even that it should be, or that, you know, that the state should somehow adopt any sort of religious, um, you know, uh, aspects of, of serving medicine. Um, it's just purely where I'm coming from. So please don't, uh, you know, please don't uh, think that I, I, I'm promoting that as the, as the solution to anything. Um, in terms of like needing a, an exception or, or whatever, I think that's an interesting statute. I think there, that, that statute runs into, I don't think that statute addresses the fact that these substances are classified as, you know, whatever class one narcotics or whatever it is that they're classified as that probably supersedes that. And so, um, you know, I, I think I, I wish that that wasn't the case. I wish that we could just practice our spirituality in whatever way we wanted to, whether it involves sacrament or not, as long as no one is harmed and it's all consensual. Um, uh, those, those laws were written when when uh, alcohol was federally classified under prohibition. So there right. there is there is actually an interesting oh. co uh, comment about that. But and and then I think the other thing to comment on is that decriminalization. We've talked a lot about here, and there's a lot of support for that. But we weren't able to get it into our bill that we've that's that's on our notes put forward. But but we were all really interested in sincere religious practice as a as a protected um, you know uh, part of being a Washingtonian. And I think it's really it's really great to understand that perspective and recognize how we think about religion nowadays and spirituality and and uh, and what our laws allow and don't allow formally. Um, and that's that's kind of what I was just illustrating that we do have some laws around this, and uh, but we don't have laws that around this for psilocybin or ayahuasca or any other entheogens we've talked about. But I think it's uh, it's worth it's worth just observing that anyway as we talk about equity today. Um, we're coming up on 10. I know, Ben, you have to leave us at 10. And um, Brian, I don't know if you want to hang on by yourself, but do you have some last thoughts uh, both of you would like to share with the group uh, before we transition? First off, thank you both for, for coming and sharing your experience and your and your thoughts. Um, I've found it very um, 
uh, enlightening. Hopefully the rest of the group has uh, gained some insight from it as well. But um, Brian, do you want to share some, some parting thoughts as it were? Yeah, I, I really like Ben's answer. I don't have anything to add to that. I do wish Todd Young's was here. It was a shame to lose him. He's one of the most articulate people I know on these topics. And, um, you know, I just, I think it's, I'm thinking about this Bill 58 in California where they, the, the most recent iteration excluded the LSD and MDMA and anything that's not an organic substance. And so I think that distinction is really important. And just to keep forward, because these things get conflated, like they're all somehow equivalent and they're not. To the realization I had earlier about language and the distinctions between First Nations, Indigenous, and entheogenic practitioners, I think that's where the bugaboo is, is lining the drawing lines between those and creating these privileged or protected classes and boxing in the possibility of evolution because these, ind these indigenous practices evolved from really a number of influences coming together. And now we're, we've got 70 pages of rules and we're, <laughs> we're creating uh, a very expensive $2,500 to $10,000 sessions, you know, I don't see how that squares with accessibility. So, so those are, I just have a lot more questions on those topics than I have answers right now. Thank you. Ben? Uh, well, I want to say thank you for having me. And I, I mean, it's really just like such an honor and a pleasure to be with you all. And I really appreciate all the questions. Uh, I, I, and the most, the thing I appreciate the most is the focus on equity and inclusion. And um, I think that's something that like in the, in the psychedelic and entheogenic world is already a big issue. Uh, here I am talking to you as an expert, like this white guy from Seattle, you know, and who's the other expert, another white guy from you know, Washington. Um, and, uh, you know, like, what do we know, right? Um, why are we in this position? It's because we're privileged and, and we have access to things that uh, some other people don't have access to. So I really, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very focused on that myself, my, my wife and I who co-lead the church. Um, uh, that's like one of our major topics of conversation pretty much all the time. Uh, in terms of accessibility, you know, like, I think what's interesting about our, our model now with it being a protected under a church um, context is like we charge $75 for a person to come. And if you can't come up with that, you can come anyway. Like we don't turn anyone away for financial reasons and we don't have a huge massive overhead because we don't have, you know, uh, 12 full-time employees that have to keep track of everything that we're doing. Uh, we just do it ourselves and we report directly to the DEA and, and everything is working fine. And so. Um, I think it's 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 very interesting to just see how we're going to bridge that gap where we can have uh, accessibility, inclusion, diversity within our population because of that, um, and all of the beautiful things that come out of that. Uh, how are we going to have that while we're also um, having to regulate it under, you know, uh, all these guidelines and government oversight and whatnot? So I know that's the big question that everybody's wrestling with. So I'm just uh, expressing my appreciation for you all wrestling with it. Uh, I feel like uh, it's it's moving forward in the way that, that I would wish it to. So um, thanks so much. I really do. I have to go, but I, I really appreciate you all. Uh, I can post my info in the chat if anybody wants to um, reach out with any more questions or anything. Uh, I'd be happy to talk with anyone at all. So um, thanks very much. Yeah, care, thank, thank you so much for the opportunity. And, and just to echo the last point Ben said, there's no paid positions in these churches. This is all volunteer work. And uh, so that's a big gap to, to the $10,000 uh, session with mushrooms. But thanks again for including our voices. It really matters. And, and uh, I think there's a lot more people that, could speak to this better than I can and a lot more people that need to be included for sure. Great. Thank you so much, Brian, Ben. Really appreciate it. Um, Senator Solomon, I see you're still on. We were going to have you go a little later, but but since we're kind of rearranging things, would you like to give a, an update now or share any thoughts with the group? Yeah, sure. That'd be great. Um, 
I do have an email I might want to read from, which would require me to pull off. But um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, this is a fascinating topic. And as I'm remembering now, based off this conversation, it's a much wider topic than even uh, I was thinking about with this bill. Um, in terms of the bill process, because I think it's also important to keep track of that, it's set for uh, coming out of policy committee on Thursday. So as far as I know, uh, the chair wants to move this out of committee. Uh, if you remember last year, it did not move out of committee. So that would represent a step forward. Then the bill goes to Ways and Means in the Senate, which is the budget committee. There, the danger there is, you know, there is a fairly high fiscal note from DOH basically saying it'd be about, you know, four or $5 million to set up the program over the next two years and be costly from there on out from a state budget perspective. So if we're gonna pass the bill that requires us to you know, convince the folks on ways and means that the investment is worth it. Um, on the, so I, I'm, I'm working on that. On the positive side, we have picked up Republican supporters uh, based, I think, on the testimony of veterans, et cetera, uh, in the policy committee. Um, so this does look like a you know, pretty, pretty good bipartisan piece of legislation. The major, and, and um, I don't know if you all watch TVW, but um, it, it's a pretty well-produced program that goes in, in very in-depth on uh, state policy issues. And so they had me on to talk about the bill for about 20 minutes. And so you can um, see that it's called Inside Olympia, uh, hosted by Austin Jenkins uh, on tvw.org. The one thing that really, uh, I have to say, threw me for a loop was some opposition from the governor's office that I was just informed of last week. And I think that's coming from the Department of Health. They Basically, they wrote that the bill as proposed would create a system for regulation that is not supported by available scientific and medical evidence. And while there's promising research, uh, it says those studies are limited and larger, more diverse clinical trials are needed to determine if this would be appropriate use as a therapeutic for diagnosed clinical conditions, which you know, if you read the bill, we're not requiring a diagnosis of clinical conditions. What they're describing sounds a lot more like the FDA research and where they're going with this. Um, the, the, the vision contemplated by this bill ignores these facts, putting the health and safety of Washingtonians at risk. In addition to the lack of clinical evidence, uh, this bill lacks the necessary safeguards to ensure public health and safety. Any system considering allowing use of psilocybin would need to involve a clear screening process uh, overseen by licensed mental health providers with robust data and patient outcomes uh, and, and suggested that we fund studies instead of this bill. Uh, so that is ominous. I'm not sure how to take it. I have a meeting set up with the governor's office tomorrow to discuss it. But it clearly contemplates a, a very different model than we, I thought we settled on. Any um, questions um, from the committee uh, for Senator Solomon comments? And just um, really quickly, Paul Stamets um, had asked about what whether I, I think the question is. So we're we're saying that there's a cap at 50 milligrams. Uh, well, you can't you can't cap the maximum dosage below 50 milligrams. But you're not, Paul. We're not saying that you have to give 50 milligrams. That's not what we're saying. We just didn't want to do all this work and then through rulemaking, have the Department of Health say, uh, you can only dose a client at five milligrams or 
you know, some other low dose that um, doesn't provide some of the benefits that we're seeking. Anyways, going back to the first question. Okay. Um, Cody, did you want to, yeah, Cody and then Sunil. Yeah. Um, okay. So, I mean, this just seems very bizarre claiming that um, we need a uh, sort of a physician overseeing prescription model for a substance that they claim has no evidence. And I think what they mean by no evidence is there is, uh, you know, it's not FDA approved. I think there's plenty of uh, clinical trial data out there to suggest that not only this is, um, you know, efficacious, but also that, um, you know, the, uh, the safety and risk profile is uh, relatively benign. And Senator, I was just curious uh, if you would find it beneficial at all uh, before your meeting tomorrow, if there would be any, comp if you would like any sort of compilation of uh, information to the contrary to um, discuss with the governor's office. Uh, it can't hurt. I, 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 I've got to feel them out. I'm pretty surprised by the email, so. Yeah. Sunil? Thank you, Senator. Um, I just think that they are so confused because the medical, the, usually the state is involved in something that involves, um, you know, pr prescribed uh, with a substance. It's usually a, uh, under a medical model. And there's, uh, or you know, harm reduction or addiction treatment. Um, the idea of a of a drug assisted service um, that's not part of a prescriptive framework, especially when something is a controlled substance, uh, is very unusual, and 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 people just don't understand that. And that's why I was really thinking that it would be really good to, uh, at the same time we're doing this, is to, you know, to to recognize that the safety of the drug is. Um, is not properly classified in the law as a schedule one. It's, uh, the, the, it sees it so unsafe that you really have to seriously restrict it. And we, I know that your bill only sort of said, we'll, we'll take out a little bit of it out of that schedule, but in general, it's still really dangerous, except if it's under the license framework. But I think that that's kind of the, the reason, well, if something's dangerous, but you use it just under certain situations, that's a prescription, you know, and that's, that's kind of the, you, you've reified that idea of risk by uh, not decriminalizing it out of the schedules. So that's my opinion. And that's why I was saying, let's at least join this lawsuit to, uh, as an amicus brief, like the ACLU and other, many others are uh, calling on the DEA to change the schedule, uh, review their decision in our in Ames versus DEA. So that's what I think is really, it has to be driven home that this is really a safe substance that we've misclassified it. Uh, and we're creating a new framework with a, with a substance that we don't think should be controlled like it is. But you can't kind of have it both ways because otherwise you are going to get stuck in the medical framework and it's going to be a much more, um, you know, we won't be able to, and the only reason Oregon got what they did is because they went through the ballot and it's still not there yet. So we don't know what it's going to look like. So I, I think you're, uh, that's the challenge of being in this space. So thank you. That's my thought, but I love your comments, your, your, your thoughts. Yeah, if I could just uh, respond real quick to that. I, I'm just going to say, you know, Schedule One is a federal issue, right? We don't have the ability to legislate that away, so we're we're therefore working under that construct. Well, regardless, your, of your colleagues did legislate it in 1971. I sent the 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 actual bill that you you know your 40 50 years ago. They didn't have to write it that way. It wasn't required. The uniformity of the state level controlled substances act was not required by the federal. They did adopt it, but every state did it differently. So there is a state level responsibility in scheduling. Many states have variations in the schedules um, from the federal. So uh, I just wanna, I, I know that there's still a, a state federal issue, but you do have a way you can write, change it. I wanna go to Emma and then Tony. Thanks, hi Senator Solomon, thanks for bringing this up. Um, just another point to maybe offer in your conversation with the governor's office tomorrow. Um, if they're wanting to situate this within the medical system, that's going to push up against the fact that we have a serious crisis in terms of healthcare workers right now. Um, many therapists, healthcare workers, doctors have not been taking on new clients, have not had space to treat the amount of people that are in need due to the mental health crisis for many years because of the pandemic. And so a piece of, you know, obviously there's lots of reasons, but one piece of why we're wanting to situate this within a wellness model and keep this out of, out of the medical system is to create many more routes of access to care by creating a whole new group of facilitators, people who can help support mental health services. 
Um, so just another point to offer you to bring to your conversation. Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for um, letting us know about this. Uh, something to uh, maybe uh, let them know they might not know is that uh, the Washington State Psychological Association uh, has endorsed this bill and none of the uh, mental health associations in Washington that I am aware of have raised the concerns that they're raising or in any way come out or even push back against this bill. So uh, for them to say that it requires a mental health <laughs> licensee to implement the bill is at odds with the actual associations of professional licensed mental health workers uh, who have all been completely fine with this being implemented under a wellness model. Uh, so I, I would just be really curious who is raising this and it, 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 it sounds like they're actually not familiar with the research is more very rigorous clinical research on psilocybin and then there is on a number of other popularly used mental health treatments. Um, so, uh, and I'd be happy to attend any of those meetings. I'm sure other people here would be happy to attend those meetings uh, as well, if that would help. Thank you. Any other comments? Cody, I, I wanna to respond to your question, why did they fund the work group if you've given your thoughts? I, you know, um, the legislative process is, uh, I've been in state government for 10 years, it's complicated. Uh, and while it seems to be a straight path, sometimes it isn't. Um, our agency, the Healthcare Authority was asked to uh, convene and facilitate this group. Um, we were asked to write a report, which we did do the draft you all saw, and, and after the next meeting, we'll put together a final report due later this year. Um, and uh, the Department of Health has, has given their input on what would be required. We are responsible for, for responding to the language in the proviso, which we have done. Your expertise has been invaluable and appreciated in all that. Um, and at the end of the day, we are um, working for the governor. And so the decisions that come aren't necessarily always um, what one, uh, you know, they in the legislature decide how they wanna write the laws. And we um, respond to what we're given to and we report things as we're asked. And at the end of the day that, you know, we support the governor and his decisions. And so I, I, I don't, I can't, I don't, I can't answer anything. I can just say that um, despite lots of work, lots of reports, lots of information, sometimes um, when you have over a hundred people also weighing in um, on something that's new. Um, and I think Sunil said it very well. Um, for people who don't live in this world like you do and don't understand the potential and the upsides and the downsides and the history and everything else, um, it it can be a challenge to get folks all on the same page. Um, and, and I just think, um, yeah, I just wanted to share those thoughts. I, I don't, and I appreciate you not feeling listened to. I, I do when I, yeah, I wanna acknowledge that. Um, Cody. Yeah. I just want to say thank you very much for that response. Um, and I was just wondering if this is a case of maybe the like right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing or um, something of that sort, uh, you know, and if there was some way to, you know, schedule, um, you know, like a, uh, a meeting between us and the Department of Health officials, you know, us folks here at the work group. Well, and I, to, um, I want to, yeah, well, I want to be clear. The Department of Health's only role in this is to give input as to what the infrastructure that would be needed to do this. They have not been asked, nor have they commented on the, the, the clinical efficacy, the safety, that has not been their charge in this. They have specifically focused and responded to what would it take to license a wellness model and what would need to be in place to do that. They have not weighed in on the clinical. We have provided the clinical information for folks to review um, and, you know, so, so the Department of Health has really only been giving input on the infrastructure, um, and 
we have shared in the report your recommendations. And so I, I, I don't, yeah, and I, I don't know where or who would hear. It's, it sounds like Senator Solomon may have some more information uh, after his discussions coming up. Um, but, but I want to be clear, we as state agencies, we basically do what we're told. We don't get to have opinions um, that are uh, out of alignment with the direction of the legislature and the governor. And so we, we support their work. Um, that is our job. Uh, and so it's, you know, we, our forming of this committee, our, our uh, support of this committee was in response to us being directed by the prov budget proviso to do so. And then, you know, we will wait um, as state agencies to see what our next direction is. Yeah, the, the department, as I said, the Department of Health does, did not provide any clinical information. That was not their purview. The Department of Health is a regulatory body only for this. They, they did not make any clinical recommendations. They did not make any recommendations as to a wellness nor a medical model. They were silent on that. That was not their work for this proviso. Just a thought, I know that you have this limited mandate, but however, if you are going to suggest that this is what a licensed person should meet qualifications for or a, a person to receive this type of wellness care, what kind of um, you know safety scenario they should be in, you, you are saying that there is a framework that, there, that this uh, substance can be used safely in some way, I, you know, that's um, beyond what the current, because um, that's the, polit the political position is that the state feels that this is very dangerous and has to have a very restricted bandwidth of use, if, it, if any uh, safe use at all. But if you're saying, no, no, you don't need a medical a medical supervision, uh, that it can be done with some with a, um, some other level of, uh, you know, a qualification and uh, requ requisite experience uh, and, and, and that kind of thing, it does change your, uh, you, you, you are making a comment about the current uh, legal um, understanding. And so it's just, it's just about uh, seeing how to interpret that mandate in a way that reflects back on what their concerns for safety are, because it's, it's really out of a concern of safety that they're uh, arguing this, this restricted medical model. It's very, they're concerned about safety. We heard some of the testimony from a psychiatrist from Northwest uh, uh, Treatment, uh, NTC, Seattle NTC. You know, I think uh, that prescriber talked about these safety issues, even though they're using off-label ketamine in their practice. They talked about the lack of FDA-approved, uh, you know, um, psilocybin, but that's a different story. Um, point is that if you can make a comment about that safety framework, that's really where they're they're going to they think they're going to hit us. Is if we, we we don't think it's safe enough. Well, no, you do think it's safe enough to, to be used outside of medical prescription. Then then that has to be explicitly stated in the in the law, the licensure, or something. That's my. Own, that's what I, I just wanted to comment for Tris. Thank you. I hope that helps. Tony. Hi. I, maybe I misheard. So please correct me. But I I thought you said that the Department of Health provided information to to uh, the legislature, the governor's office. Uh, it was that information only about the wellness model, or but did it include about the safety profile no, or anything did, else? It didn't, no, the information was what was asked as part of the proviso. So we don't we don't get to just sort of say, hey, here's a good idea. We would like you okay. to look at it. We we the Department of Health responded directly to the language in the proviso, and we the healthcare authority also. Uh, uh, it responded to what we were required to do. We really don't get to um, offer up more than we're asked to. So we can, um, I see there's some in the chat. I, I wanna, I, I wanna um, see if Senator Solomon has any comments. I do info coming from the Gov, DOH, the Gov's office outside the provider. Okay, um, so let let's let's do this. I'm seeing a lot in the chat. Um, we send it. What do we summary or summary? Okay, so Senator, it looks like you're going to be getting uh, another list of the summary of all the articles. I believe Cody took the time to put together. Uh, 
Um, and comprehensive document, it was very safety data sent again, Emma. Okay. So um, I want to just check with the group. Um, we had planned to, and we can still do this, but I also don't want to um, cut short this part of the conversation, which is also um, important. I'm just looking at our agenda here. Senator Solomon, do you want to add anything um, before I know you have to join sure. a I, do your yeah, day I, job? Part of my day job. Um, I I don't know much more than what's in the email, uh, so I'm just gonna have a conversation with the governor's office. Um, you know, I I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't attribute it to one department or the other. I just uh, I know what. I read to you. That's it. And we'll work on it. Thank you for taking the time. I know you're busy in session right now. Um, let's move on to equity. Okay, Emma, thank you. All right. Um, so thank you for taking the lead there. All right, Duncan, I believe you're up. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, we can definitely shift gears to equity. Uh, so the intent of kind of my work that I've been doing is, you know, the end, the result of this work group, the end of this work group will be to, um, submit a report to the legislature and that report will I mean, have some bearing and we'll have all of our recommendations and everything that you all have put forward to us. And I think that's incredibly valuable. And so the la one of the last steps we're going to do with this work group is we're going to compile an equity report and we're or an equity survey that we've worked on and we're going to run by you today. And we want your feedback on this and this uh, questionnaire is going to be submitted to the public. So not only will you all have the chance to give your feedback on how you think it should be structured, what you think we should be asking, but also you'll be able to fill it out yourself. We'll receive all the data and submit it back to you. And that will hopefully be included in the final report. And so I think despite what we've just heard about the bill status and whatnot, I think our work here is still really valuable as respect to equity. I think we have the opportunity to develop a really comprehensive plan that can kind of help aid the restrictions that we've heard in terms of the DOH and the legislature not being able to provide funds to kind of offset licensing fees, um, participant fees, et cetera. Um, and apologize for my voice, I'm kind of sick. So what I have been doing over the past month or two is I've kind of reviewed some of my own scholarship. I've looked back at the work group interviews where you all commented on equity and gave some great recommendations. Um, I look back at the social opportunity program once again, uh, kind of the DOH and their role and what they can and cannot do. And so this is just going to be a really short walkthrough and then we'll get to the questionnaire and give you guys a chance to kind of respond to it. But this is just to kind of compile all our thoughts on equity so far. So the social opportunity program, this is a long slide. Um, you all have, we've talked about this before, but just as a reminder, the social opportunity program is broadly just establishing distressed areas and then offering assistance to that. And so the question is, this work group was tasked with addressing that and commenting on it. Uh, we want to know how we can improve this, how we can make it better, how we can expand it so that it's more effective when actually implemented. And then the Department of Health. So the Department of Health has these duties, including enforcing licensing requirements. Um, in their presentation to us, they discussed the Uniform Disciplinary Act, as we know, uh, working with a schedule and federal one, a schedule and substance federally will be uh, an issue that we'll have to work through. And then lastly, just a reminder that the Department of Health must um, set fees that result in full cost recovery. So the licensing cannot be altered. The Department of Health has to set fees that will make back the money that they're spending to implement the program. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about very first briefly was just the kind of state equity programs that are most relevant to psilocybin in Washington. And so firstly, uh, 
while this is rare and both of these situations were kind of um, unique, uh, the Washington State legislature, ha legislature has provided financial assistance for offsetting license fees in the past. So that happened with midwives and emergency medical professionals. So there is some, even though it is a kind of unique and niche circumstances, there is precedent for license assistance. And then secondly, what I wanted to kind of just go over, because I think we can learn something from it, and it's relevant to what we're talking about in Washington and to the Social Opportunity Program, is um, the State Cannabis Social Equity Program. So this program and the cannabis kind of effort in general in Washington has received a lot of criticism, many of it rightfully so, but also this program uh, is very, very similar to the Social Opportunity Program, and I think we can learn from it both in terms of what they are maybe doing right and what they could have improved on and so similar to the social opportunity opportunity program this uh this program establishes kind of disproportionately impacted areas um the other two qualifications for qualifying for the csep is an applicant can have a family mem member that has been convicted of a crime related to cannabis in the past and then lastly, if the household income is less than the median income in Washington state. So there are all these qualifications. This doesn't guarantee that you receive access to the program, but these are all the kind of points in which you could apply. So the social equity program for cannabis uh, has a little more than a million dollars to provide these services. And so I think this is where we can kind of learn from this and think about what we might want to suggest or include for um, our own social opportunity program for psilocybin just providing kind of a broader umbrella of assistance tools that help um, poor and marginalized communities especially work on their efforts to gain licensure and to get their business up and running so they're not excluded so we have all these kind of different tools that whether or not the funding is being adequately distributed within this program this is a part of their a part of their plan that they are attempting to implement using the funds provided to them in order to assist individuals to uh, start their cannabis program up. And then the critiques of this program, I also think, are really important to think about when we're designing our own. And so, one of the main shortcomings of this program are so not enough licenses are being planned to be redistributed uh, under a potential program for psilocybin we could set aside a certain amount of licenses that could potentially qualify within the social opportunity program. Uh, the lottery system in the CSEP inherently favors those with more capital because you purchase more lottery tickets, therefore excluding those who can't purchase more. Uh, there's limitations on the number of retail stores um, available. Uh, there's certain kind of zoning where a greater proportion of programs are set in rural areas, which often kind of leads to less diversity in the employees and owners or just generally making sure that there's kind of enough opportunity for retail stores to be set up in certain areas so that it's not only the lottery system that's being discriminatory, but also kind of the zoning that was in the legislation. And then there's also a critique that there's no uh, focus on the inequities on the production side. So we're only focusing on the retail side and the licensure, but there's also a vast lack of ownership for poor and marginalized communities on the production side of cannabis. So in order to make the psilocybin program as inclusive as possible, we also have to think about that. And then, of course, lastly, federal illegality remains a concern for um, all individuals, especially for poor and marginalized communities who have a harder time obtaining bank loans. OK, so I don't have to go into great depth, but these are kind of the themes that I drew out of our discussions and our work of potential tools and strategies that could be implemented, some of which are outside kind of the government structure that could help uh, the psilocybin program be more accessible to those for those who need it. And so we have sliding scale fees. Most of you probably understand this concept, but this would be done by private practice. We have telemedicine. So Telemedicine has been shown time and time again to reduce costs generally, and obviously that's not really an option when it comes to the actual facilitation, but the integration sessions and the screening sessions are in many ways just as important, and so incorporating telemedicine into those processes can be hugely important for reducing costs, and we have to think about how to do that in a streamlined and accessible way 
you know, providing language alternatives, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have these three strategies as well. We have scholarships. So scholarships could be offered by outside organizations that could be applied for where you could earn funds or assistance to apply for licensure. We have vouchers, which is kind of another strategy that could be done by the government or an outside donor, where what this allows us to do is very uh, directly target certain populations and allow them a discounted price through this voucher system while keeping the same standard amount of price through the Department of Health or through whatever government body is organizing this. You could offer this voucher system to reduce prices in that case. And then lastly, uh, we have group therapy, group work, group sessions. This is probably our most promising strategy that we've talked a lot about in our work group sessions. Facilitators could offer, multiple facilitators could facilitate um, psilocybin to a variety, to a multiple clientele, to multiple participants. Uh, and this would reduce costs by allowing uh, facilitators to serve multiple people at once. And this could be done not only for the actual facilitation of the medicine, but also for the integration and extended care sessions. So there could be some sort of some sort of communal work where a facilitator is kind of holding a community discussion to help integrate and discuss your experience with psilocybin. So those are the kind of tools and strategies I've outlined. And then lastly, I want to make sure we have time to get to our um, discussion of the survey. But in my own independent research, what I think I came across time and time again was just this in really incredible emphasis on community participation being critical for equity. And I think that's really important to talk about in relation to setting up a psilocybin program. So we know that even with high amounts of financial assistance, healthcare programs being introduced into a new community, especially a poor marginalized community where there's higher distrust around the medical community in general, uh, they can often be unsuccessful if they're not if they're not kind of uh, in, they're not um, integrated into the community. You don't take effort to reach out to community organizations and make sure that there is trust and that you are looking after the interests of the community. And this is especially true uh, considering the stigma surrounding psilocybin and its status as a schedule of drug. And so I kind of looked into community mental health, which is a framework or a theory that just promotes individualized care and cohesive care. And so by no means am I suggesting that this could be included fully, but kind of what the research suggests is that uh, incorporating and building coalitions with local shelters, food banks, addiction center support groups, uh, training organizations, housing assistance, education, counseling, by no means can a psilocybin program do all these things. But what's critical is thinking about these alternative forms of support when approaching mental health in poor and marginalized communities and making sure that psilocybin centers have some way to integrate with the community and facilitate this uh, community work. And then the same applies for community health workers. Uh, this work group has talked in the past about how to intentionally recruit individuals from the communities and have community participation in these programs. And working with community health workers is one of the best way to do that. So incorporating these individuals, making sure their roles is well-defined so that they can best reflect the interests of the community and then the healthcare program can reflect that back is really essential for creating equitable work. It can't just be kind of financial assistance. And then this is just kind of more detail on telemedicine equity, which I think is really critical. Telemedicine is a really important tool for facilitating reduction of price. And it has to be done so with efforts of digital literacy and kind of cultural relevancy so that we can best incorporate individuals and make an equitable plan. And so the last little bit I want to talk about, and then I'll move into the questionnaire and we can just talk about that really quickly, is I think it's important to think about how this work group wants to potentially measure success. So I think we need to have some sort of dialogue about how to collect data and what that data is seeking. So what data markers are we looking for? What is our goal in terms of price? I know we've talked about that in the past. What is the most important factor of our equity program? Is it access? Is it workforce licensure? And just create the system so that we're collecting data, we're reflecting on it, and we're measuring whether or not kind of our equity plan is being successful. So that was just 
a little synthesis. Thank you for listening to that. Uh, should we take questions or should I just go right into a discussion of the survey? You know, Duncan, maybe maybe if you go into the discussion of the survey with what you've just said, that will have folks maybe give some feedback as we go. I, I don't feel strongly, but I think really we want to make sure that that the that the tool we're going to to spend, you know, distribute broadly is is what we want it to be. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so I'll share. And, and Duncan, before you, this, Mike, I just wanted to make sure everybody kind of is, is clear. I, I think you just just did a super job of walking through kind of that that equity overview. But I just want to make sure for the work group, we understand kind of where this fits within all your work. So. If you guys remember in that budget proviso that Teresa referred to, really we had five steps, right, that you guys have been tasked to look at. Everything from reviewing Oregon Health Authorities programs to Liquor and Cannabis Board to, you know, Department of Health, um, you know, uh, cap capabilities uh, and even kind of the, the licensing issues. The last one really had to do was equity and looking at uh, Senate Bill 5660 related to the social opportunity program and, and weighing in. So this is really this last piece that we really wanted to to uh, to take some time. And I think I, I do want to give some kudos to Tanya Silvas, our, our work group members. We had some discussion with Tanya where she was helping, I think, you know, better inform the kind of the, the HCA body of work of how can we get cast a broader net. To get feedback. So it's one thing to have this discussion here just within a work group, but then how can we actually go and reach others around their opinions and thoughts around equity? So this survey that you're going to see kind of in draft form, so again, you guys have a chance to edit and mold it, as Duncan said earlier, would then kind of get finalized and then go to you, but then hopefully you would complete it, but then you'd send it out to others. So we're trying to really understand, like, how do we get this out? To a broader population and get as you know kind of uh as many people as possible to respond and then that comes back and that would be part of the final report and we bring bring that back to the to, to meeting number six so i just want to make sure you guys kind of understand the kind of the flow of everything that's happening and then the context of this uh, of this survey thanks duncan yeah no thank you mike for the framing so here we have our questionnaire uh as mike just explained we want to best address all the questions about surrounding equity so that we can kind of create this cohesive report with as many recommendations and strategies as possible so that that can go to the legislature. So I just kind of introduce what we're discussing here. I have uh, an acknowledgement of psychedelics and their history in indigenous communities. We're gonna ask for a series of background and demographics questions just so we understand where are recommended from and the background of the people responding so that we understand who, where their thoughts are coming from. So we're asking about your employment field, um, your experience and knowledge in psychedelics. And so what we have, we have 11 questions and then kind of three feedback questions at the end. And I'll just spend a very brief amount of time on each of them and give you guys all the chance to read over them and I'd love you to all kind of think about like what you think should be included or changed. Uh, we're gonna give you the opportunity to by email or whatever format, send us, I mean, ideally broad recommendations instead of detailed ones because the editing process might get confusing that way, but broad recommendations on kind of feedback and additional questions or questions that should be changed. So first question, just discussing kind of these strategies and, uh, how you would order them and what is most important. Oh, and I'm so sorry, before we move on, I just wanna add what we're doing with the survey because if it's being sent out to the general public, we acknowledge that a lot of these questions have kind of some niche knowledge requirements and some terms that might not be clear. I put together a memo that is coming below, explain and define all these terms that we're discussing just so that if people don't have the back can kind of look down and get a further explanation on everything that is included in the questionnaire and so i'll give you oh and i would just yeah. add one more thing that that i had to have duncan remind me this this is just for the purpose of 
drafting and framing the uh, the actual survey will not look so daunting. You won't be able to see it um, scrolling all at once, and so it'll it'll be a little bit um, it, it'll be a little bit more um, user friendly uh, on the on the face of it. Yeah, this, this is true. Yeah, we're gonna put it in Qualtrics, kind of make it more visually pleasing. So question two, very straightforward. Uh, what about the social opportunity program is important? What could be improved? Um, third, this is kind of what I briefly mentioned with those slides earlier. We're asking um, if you support the idea of the social opportunity program being used to give a certain percentage of the licenses that we are distributing in this future program, um, make those that percentage be required that individuals be qualified for the social opportunity program. So that could be something like 25% of licenses must go to social opportunity program applicants. And then we have uh, just an opportunity for people to expand on that. Uh, for four, how strongly would you support the administration of psilocybin not in a licensed facilitation center? So we're asking if care can be extended kind of to in-home care, and if so, for which groups of people? Should it be available for everybody? Should it just be available for certain individuals who qualify? What allows you to qualify for that in-home care, et cetera? Five, another broad question about how uh, facilitation centers can best integrate with the community. For six, we have what we heard Angie talk about in the very beginning, which is should facilitation centers be required to put together an equity plan um, and if so, what would that look like? And also, should these equity plans be binding or enforceable? So th should they just be required to submit one so that there is that thought and intention in mind, or would this be enforceable in some way? Question seven is about group sessions, which we've talked so much about, but we thought it was important to continue to ask about. Um, and so we're just asking about, like, do you think this is a good idea? And what feedback do you have? Uh, and the question questions from 8, 9, 10, and 11 down uh, go very broad, but we thought it was important to just give the opportunity for people to respond with as much specificity as they'd like. So we're asking about how to best foster access for poor and marginalized communities, how to best uh, and intentionally fairly recruit individuals from these communities. Then here, number 10, we ask about data markers or goals. So what are we actually looking for in terms of success with this program? And how are we gonna measure success? in terms of data over time and how we can collect that data. And then lastly, uh, how do we participate, how do we practice reciprocity with indigenous groups and respect the history that we've talked about today? How do we kind of work with those communities and make sure we're going about this work in a respectful way? And then lastly, we have the feedback. So just three questions about whether we should have included other questions, et cetera, et cetera. So that is my walkthrough. Um, I'm happy to take questions or comments or anything like that. Mike, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, Duncan, I just want to make sure we're clear too. So this will be sent out to everybody after today. And we will be giving folks some time to respond back to you. And I, can you remind me again, the, the time, there you go. You had it right there. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we're giving you guys three or four days to kind of draft any edits or suggestions, like I said, feel free to, well, I don't, I don't know if we have a specific plan on how you would send those, but I think email would be fine. And we'll take a look at those. We'll compile a final draft for the, for the survey. We'll release it. We'll let that be distributed. Uh, and at some point we will close that survey and then kind of collect the data, analyze it all and present it back. And we can all discuss it in April, which will be our final survey where we'll also, I believe, be discussing the final report to the legislature or the draft of what we'll have. Right. So, so Duncan, thanks for that. That's really helpful. So, yeah, I think, right. We've got, uh, you know, 14 minutes. So I think we wanted to, there were some, some initial observations, thoughts on the survey that we just walked through would welcome some initial feedback, but then you'll have time, right. To review on your own and then give Duncan some direct feedback. But the idea is that we want to kind of capture that as quickly as we can to kind of wrap this survey and get this sent out to everybody. So I also want you guys to be thinking about who else you would want to send this to kind of on a much more kind of distributed network, but we would love this to have this as far reaching as possible. 
I just want to respond quickly, Mike, as folks think about their comments to some things in the chat. The survey is meant to go to committee members and then whomever they would like to share it with. I know that uh, in our discussions with Dr. Silva, she mentioned she was engaged with a lot of different groups outside of, of her day job and in the community and so felt that accessing those groups would be good. So really whoever the committee thinks would be important to weigh in on this. Um, uh, unfortunately, Lisa, yes, the timeline is is kind of fast. It's really up to Duncan. Um, I, I don't know what, uh, if he's put when exactly he wants it back, um, but we do wanna be able to get the survey out and, and allow enough time for a response so we can incorporate it into, um, into the um, final report. And yes, all of the surveys are being included, you know, in the report. Um, uh, everything that you've, everything that Duncan's worked with you all on reporting has uh, showed up in the report. We're trying to produce everything that has been part of these meetings into the into the report. Or Mike is, I'm not. Uh, and then um, let's see these links updates. Um, okay, we'll respond to that. Uh, seven day. It's really up to Duncan, Lisa. Duncan's the timekeeper. So, um, Duncan, can we make it? Feet. Can we make it end of day next Monday? Yeah, definitely. That Lisa, was, that's. I think that's a good point. Let's let's well, do and that. Lisa, there's a, a difference between the the questions that the community thinks should be part of this survey, and the community's response to the survey. I just they're they're two great yeah. great points, Tracy. Yeah, so so this survey will be open, and Duncan, I think we're still going to talk about this for a, a minimum of two plus weeks for everybody. This was once it gets finalized. This is just feedback on any kind of final edits to these questions and to the framing of this. And this is specific to you guys as a work group. Yes. Yeah. Given your participation That's right. in all our conversations. So what, why don't we make that official end of day Monday, next Monday for, for your, your feedback and edits. Yeah, thanks. I thought I saw some hand. I see a hand raised. Am I sorry? Yeah. Um, for the for question number one, um, I think it'd be helpful to have descriptions of what those are mm. in there. I just imagining somebody who has like no clue what we're talking about. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Other thoughts? I know we went through this quickly and you'll have plenty of time, but I, I would, any anything else kind of stand out as you think through this? Um, just a, on, a clarification oh. um, on where we're sending our feedback to. Thanks. Why don't we put that, Duncan, why don't we put your um, email in the chat? Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, it's a great question. And we'll we'll do that when we send it out to the work group. Um, yeah, I, I'm new, so I don't think I'm on that mailing list. Great. Uh, Tanya Silvest, any thoughts, comments from you? Or she may had had she, to leave early. So Lisa, yeah, but Lisa is is in her stead today. So Dr. Price may have some comments. No, I don't have any comments. I'll just look forward to um, being able to re review this, um, the document. And then once, and Duncan, and, and thanks, Mike, for asking to extend it, because I think it's really important that we have that time to do that. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Lisa. I would just, I think, you know, I think Duncan's done a nice job putting a lot of information here, but also recognizing that, you know, we all probably fill out more paperwork than we want to all day, every day. But if we're really trying to broaden the reach of this, we don't want to overwhelm folks with an unending survey. So it's always tricky to know that balance of, of we could ask a million questions because they're all important, but how do we get, and recognizing that this isn't, 
in it of itself, it'll it will be helpful, but it won't give us the roadmap. But it will hopefully be a good foundation for future discussions and 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 how we should think about going forward. Hey, Sharice, I just saw Sunil's question. Sunil, oh. we've gone we've gone back and forth on that. We have not included dollar amounts, but I, I we were we'd be open. And it's kind of like what what would you even put as ranges? But if you guys have thoughts on that would welcome feedback i mean the easiest thing to do would be just to say put what oregon has written down uh so that since we don't know but at least we know one thing out there and you can see if people agree or disagree with that but i do think it's important to do that because otherwise it's uh you know very vague and broad and we don't really have it equity is about barriers and one of the biggest barriers we've identified is financial there's many others but that's a big one so um the more we can do to clarify that the better i think the data would be and more meaning also just to clarify for all of you we're putting this into a software that can like have drop down menu questions that are like multiple choice or like sunil's have kind of like a bracket just send me what you think the brackets could be and we could include it in that form and then emma you have a question yeah thanks um duncan or anybody else can let me know if this would make sense to have this on here or not um for me, I, you know, I know that this group has had a lot of back and forth around decrim and we've had a pretty clear like this is not what we're doing in this group. Um, and I just I'm curious if it would make sense to have a question in here of like people seeing decrim as a ne necessary piece of equity around access to psilocybin. Um, I'd love to see more community input on the intersection there, uh, just to have more information if we do at some point decide to try to push more for total decrim as a piece of how we make sure that this is equitable. Yeah. That's a great point, Emma. One I almost almost an oversight, maybe on our part, Duncan. But I think that's I don't know what I was saying, but I, I think that could be a really that's a that's a good question, probably to add. Yeah. To piggyback on that, maybe thing in the language of like, would this would the criminal status still be a barrier for you utilizing mm -hmm. these services? Mm -hmm. Got it. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay. Great points, guys. Thanks. I'm going to stop my share. Duncan, thank you again. Yeah. Great work. Thank you. Um, it looks like we're getting near the end. I um, I want to th see Brian Stellano, Senator Solomon, had to go do his committee work or Senator work. Um, I, I want to thank everybody for their participation today. I, I know, uh, you know, what Senator Solomon said was kind of a downer and, and all I can share is my perspective having worked in government for 10 years and, and that is that, you know, sometimes things work move much more slowly than we, they want and I think, you know, we've We've tried to be really deliberate um, and Mike and his team have been in the support of this group to really gather information and thought and, and ask and answer the questions we could think of, whether or not things move at the speed that that this group would like. Um, you know, what are the elements that are important regardless of the time frame with which this moves forward or regardless of the way in which this moves forward. So, so I, and I don't, I can't predict the future. I don't have a crystal ball. It's not my decision, but, but I don't want folks to, to feel badly um, that their time hasn't been well spent. It's been incredibly useful and informative to, to us. And however this moves forward, we have really good information. Thanks to you, all your expertise, um, the folks that we brought in to, to help us learn. And so I, I know that doesn't feel good, but one thing you do learn being a government employee is that sometimes it takes a while to get the stuff that, that you're trying to get done done um and and i just just want to share that thought with you right so Sharisa, next next meeting we have scheduled is not until april and i think the plan of attack for that meeting is for us to kind of go through step by step the actual draft final report so you guys will see it. And yep. I think Sunil made a comment, are all those 
surveys that you guys have done over the last, you know, many times that will all be there in dependencies, but you will kind of go through step by step of what you've been tasked to do. And then kind of the, the series of recommendations and kind of the discussions from this work group. So we'll kind of try to have that in draft form, try to get that out to you in advance. So you have some time to review, and then we'll go through that at the last meeting in April. Any last thoughts, comments from the committee? Um, I, I'm just curious, um, where can efforts, I guess I'll just speak for myself, where could efforts be put to help you all um, until April? I know that we'll have the, the survey and getting those out to people, but is there any other like admin background, anything that needs being done that could use an extra set of hands? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're referencing, Rebecca, but Mike and his team are, are really the ones who've been coordinating, leading, and supporting all this work um, in contract with the healthcare authority. So I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you're referencing. Um, well, Rebecca, I appreciate the, the follow. I, I think we're going to do our best to get this survey out and then make sure that we can kind of get those results and incorporate those into the draft report. I think if there's action that's being taken within the legislature right now and any assistance you can provide Senator Solomon. And I th it seems like this group is mobilized pretty well. I think that would probably be some, some great efforts and activity there. Yeah. And, and I just want to be clear, that is a recommendation of Mike um, as an <laughs> individual. And that, and that is not a recommendation of the Healthcare Fair Authority. We, we are unable to do that. Thanks, Rita. All right. Well, again, everybody appreciate your time. I think it's been a really good meeting. Uh, Cody, uh, um, thanks for all your input and, and putting that list together initially. Brian, thank you um, for your participation and Ben as well. Um, so we look forward to seeing you in April um, and getting your feedback to Duncan so that we can then get this back out into uh, community and make sure that we uh, continue to move forward um, with a good foundation for hopefully how to do something this large and important uh, with some thought and, and um, foresight. So thanks all, have a good rest of the day. Thank you guys.